hey everyone welcome back to my channel so a lot of you guys requested a video about uh, GI questions particularly the uh, GI hormone ones so I compiled uh, the most challenging concepts of GI uh, questions in your world and hopefully by the end of this video you wouldn't find these questions hard again so the first question like I always tell you guys I read the last two lines because they give away the diagnosis uh, so essentially the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis is made you see guys it gave it away and a specific etiology is established but of course they wouldn't tell you what this etiology is which of the following additional lab findings is most specific for the underlying cause of this patient's pancreatitis so you're required to figure out the cause of this patient's acute pancreatitis and then then infer a lab findings finding that is specific to this etiology so let's read from the beginning a 45 year old man comes to the ER due to sudden onset vomiting and severe upper abdominal pain that radiates to his back this is typical of pancreatitis the patient's total bilirubin is not significant ast is 98 alt is 32 obviously guys as you can see ast is about triple the alt and this is specific to alcoholism if you remember but i'm gonna skip this for now serum lipase is markedly increased this is uh specific for acute pancreatitis so he's a guy with epigastric pain radiating to his back and he has high serum lipase so obviously has acute pancreatitis now we have two most common causes of acute pancreatitis the most common cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstones and the second most common cause is chronic alcoholism abdominal ultrasound reveals a normal gallbladder and common bile duct so now we've excluded gallstones and so we should be thinking about chronic alcoholism as a possible cause, right? So you got, these are the causes, and we know that the most common is gallstones, and ethanol is the second. And high serum amylase or lipase, and we've seen high serum lipase in this patient. So technically, like I told you guys, AST in this patient is about triple the ALT and if AST to ALT ratio is more than two this is specific for alcoholism so now we know that this guy has acute pancreatitis because of chronic alcoholism now the question is asking which of the following additional lab findings is most specific for the underlying cause which is alcoholism so which of these lab findings is specific for chronic alcoholics in addition to having a, a ast alt ratio over two what else do they have that's essentially what it's asking right mean corpuscular volume of 108 is considered macrocytosis and indeed this is seen guys in chronic alcoholics if you look at the causes of macrocytosis, you find chronic alcohol overuse and liver disease. Essentially because those people, um, chronic alcoholics, have a lot of vitamin deficiencies, including folate. And they also have like the toxic effect of alcohol on the bone marrow can sometimes impair uh, proper synthesis, leading to macrocytosis again. It's non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia due to chronic alcohol overuse. It's pretty well known, right? So, yes, it's true. Now, let's look at the other answer choices. Serum calcium level of 8, this is pretty low. Hypocalcemia, guys, is seen with severe pancreatitis. But we're talking here, which is most specific for alcoholism? which is the underlying cause here. How did I know this is the underlying cause? Number one, because no gallstones, so we've excluded the most common cause. The second most common must be alcoholism. Number two, there is something very important here, which is that the AST is double or triple or like 
more than two times the ALT ratio and this is specific to alcoholism. This is how I figured out and then I inferred this answer choice. White blood cell count, this is relatively non-specific, guys. Any uh, any inflammation, like any infection would show high white blood cell count. So it's not really specific for alcoholism. Moving. All right, moving on to the next question. Like I always tell you, read the last two lines first. So microscopy, the gastric mucosa reveals parietal cell hyperplasia. Which of the following stimuli is the most likely cause of parietal cell proliferation in this patient? If you know the factoid, guys, you would answer this question without reading it. Just using this, I swear, if you're in the middle of the test, you're just going to choose the hormone that causes parietal cell hyperplasia in order to produce gastric acid. And what else would it be other than gastrin, right? However, I want you to understand and not just memorize. So I'm going to show you guys why it's gastrin that uh, grows the gastric mucosa or leads to parietal cell hyperplasia. So we're going to read the whole question. A 32-year-old man comes to the clinic for peptic ulcer disease follow-up. The patient has received several months of PPI therapy without significant improvement, his epigastric discomfort, which means that um, it must be something else other than the orthodox like conventional causes. He does not use NSAIDs, tobacco, or alcohol, so none of the risk factors. H. pylori test is negative. The patient undergoes a partial gastrectomy for refractory peptic ulcer disease. So you can see, guys, that this patient doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, and doesn't have H. pylori, but and they're still suffering from refractory peptic ulcer disease with none of the risk factors, and PPIs didn't work, which means something else is wrong. The pathologist receives the tissue and no significant enlargement. The gastric rugal folds on gross examination, and microscopy, the gastric mucosa, reveals parietal cell hyperplasia. There is a hormone that is secreted here in excess, right, which is gastrin, we already agreed on that, which is causing parietal cell hyperplasia. And the parietal cells we know, guys, produce a lot of acid. And it's this acid that's causing him refractory peptic ulcer disease. Now, this is because this guy has gastrinoma. He has a tumor that's producing a lot of gastrin. That's why the physician or the surgeon had to remove... Uh, had to do partial gastrectomy, right, guys? So this is like, why did I tell you? Uh, like, why did I answer this question without re reading the whole stem when I just read microscopy reveals um, parietal cell hyperplasia? This is because I know the action of gastrin, right? Gastrin increases gastric hydrogen secretion by acting on parietal cells, and that's why he's getting a peptic ulcer. Number two, it increases growth of gastric mucosa, and that is why the pathologist found enlargement of the gastric rugal folds. And that is why on microscopy we found uh, parietal cell hyperplasia because the way by which gastrin grows the stomach or uh, its trophic effect on the stomach is by growing parietal cells and in turn these parietal cells keep producing um, acid and gastrin has a direct effect as well on these cells which produce acid and so in the end you get peptic ulcer that's why uh, so this guy most likely has Zollinger-Ellison syndrome or gastrinoma where he's secreting a lot of it. Um, and that's probably what's causing him refractory peptic ulcer disease. Now, the other choices don't really apply. Acetylcholine, we know it's um, acetylcholine increases acid secretion, but it wouldn't cause growth of gastric mucosa, right? Um, secretin. I think this is uh, this increases pancreatic secretions. 
Serotonin increases motility, has nothing to do with that. Somatostatin is an inhibitory hormone. It inhibits everything, essentially. It inhibits gastric acid secretion, so that doesn't apply at all. Uh, and it also inhibits pancreatic secretions. Transforming growth factor alpha doesn't apply here. It leads to growth of epithelial cells. So literally, this question is just a freebie. Okay, uh, moving on. All right, researchers studying gastrointestinal pathophysiology analyzed hundreds of gastric mucosal biopsy specimens taken from patients who underwent endoscopy at a local tertiary care center. They noticed that colonization in the gastric antrum, antrum, and I want to underline that, with S-shaped gram-negative bacteria, I'm sure a lot of you have already guessed it's H. pylori, all right, is associated with a decreased number of somatostatin-producing antral cells. So you got bacteria, the H. pylori bacteria, when they, um, when they colonize the antrum of the stomach, just imagine that this is the antrum. They will lead to depletion of antral cells that produce somatostatin. And in the last slide, I told you guys that somatostatin decreases acid secretion. Depletion of these cells from the gastric antrum is most likely to cause which of the following conditions. It's pretty straightforward that if you have, we know that somatostatin is produced by D cells in the gastric antrum and these inhibit gastric acid and so if you remove somatostatin then you have a lot of gastric acid and what does gastric acid do it leads to peptic ulcer right so this helped us eliminate the rest of the answer choices and so we're left with either duodenal ulcers or gastric ulcer right a stomach ulcer after all but where right guys like i said the question is saying that it's colonizing the gastric antrum all right so here's the h pylori in the gastric antrum there the h pylori is essentially eroding the epithelium with its toxins so in the antrum the mucosa is not protected right because there is infection there and at the same time, the somatostatin cells that are supposed to protect against gastric acid are depleted, right? And so you have a lot of gastrin. No one is, no one is stopping acid secretion, so you have a lot of acid. What do you think will be the area most affected? Is it the area where there is infection and mucosal erosion? Would this be the area most affected? by a lot of acid or is it the area that has no infection of course the area that has infection or that it's near the infection because this is the unprotected area where there is mucosal erosion and so the acid will affect it more especially that somatostatin was stopping acid secretion and it was also uh, protecting the duodenum right and so obviously it will lead to duodenal ulcer not a gastric ulcer. The gastric ulcer means up there when there is no infection right here anyways, right? Uh, by the, So it's a duodenal ulcer. However, I want you guys to focus on this answer choice, gastric lymphoma. We know that H. pylori increases the risk of gastric lymphoma. That's right. If it colonizes the fundus and body, because in these areas, it leads to malignancy like uh, mouth lymphoma and also uh, there is another type of malignancy uh, adenocarcinoma uh, this would be a more common pathology induced by h pylori if it colonized the body and fundus of the stomach but if it colonizes the antrum it's more likely to cause duodenal ulcer all right, moving on to the next question. This is the last question, guys. Uh, and I'm sure most of you can diagnose by just looking at the CT scan. 
Uh, that's what I do, by the way, but I'm just going to read the question for you uh, for context. A 53-year-old man, and I like to highlight the demographic because it tells me a lot about the risk. Uh, comes to the physician with progressively worsening anorexia and abdominal discomfort. He has lost 14 kilograms, 31 pounds, since the onset of his symptoms about four months ago. As you can see, guys, you have a man over 50, male over 50, with anorexia, significant weight loss in a short period of time. This is alarming. Physical exam demonstrates non-tender hepatomegaly. Lab studies show an elevated serum ulcfos and a marginally elevated ALT. So obviously there is some malignancy in the liver. A contrast enhanced CT scan the abdomen is shown below. Here's the liver, guys. You have a focus here. A lesion here there and there like everywhere and it's multiple and it's very important to notice that it is multiple right because if you notice I want you to look at the big picture if you look at the big picture and imagine the choices like as if you are like a bird's eye view you will notice that all of these hepatic adenoma angiosarcoma hepatocellular carcinoma all of these are primary tumors of the liver. But this one, metastatic liver disease, is the only one that is a secondary, right? So when you see multiple lesions on CT, you should expect that it's a primary tumor has sent secondary distant metastases to the liver. And by the way, the most common neoplasm of the liver is metastasis, not a primary tumor, not hepatocellular carcinoma, right? So there's two reasons to choose metastatic liver disease here. Number one, because it's multiple like this away from each other. It looks like it's... Um, sent from somewhere else, distant metastasis, simply because metastases are sent via blood. So you got foci of malignant cells from somewhere else, from the colon, for instance, through the bloodstream, and they're going to reside somewhere here. Unlike when it's coming out of the liver as a primary lesion, it's going to come out somewhere here, for example, and then extend like this. So it's going to be like one focus, no matter how large it is, right? So it's not going to be like that. Okay, so this is the first reason why you should choose metastatic liver disease. The second reason is that it is the most common, okay? And what's common is common. So you must have noticed that all of these are primary lesions, and this is the only one that's metastatic, right? And also remember, guys, that... Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma doesn't arise in such a relatively young age, right? Uh, usually, hepatocellular carcinoma is seen in people with advanced liver cirrhosis. So it's someone who has had, for example, hepatitis, uh, B or C, chronic hepatitis, and then developed cirrhosis, and then HCC, or someone who has, for example, alcoholic liver disease for like a long period, then developed cirrhosis, and then HCC. So it would be seen in like someone in their 60s and 70s, and not early 50s like that, right? Uh, so yeah, let me know what you think in the comments.